Hello friends, this is JB with Not By Works Ministries, and today we're going to take a look at part six in our ongoing video series entitled, How We Got Our Bible. How We Got Our Bible. You know, it's so important to understand that the gift God gave us when he gave us his word is reliable, it's trustworthy, it contains everything we need for life and godliness, and most importantly, it's the only standard on which we base our beliefs, attitudes, and practices. We live in a world that is searching for truth. It's searching for truth in all the wrong places, unfortunately, and the truth is under attack. Most people say there is no stake in the ground. There are no absolutes. There is no ultimate grand meta narrative of truth that is always true for all people at all times. But we believe that's precisely what we have in the Word of God. When we hold the Bible in our hands, it gives us everything we need for life and godliness, and it is the standard through which we judge and evaluate all truth claims uh, from any and all sources. And so it's important for us to kind of understand that and to help bolster our faith in the Word of God. Uh, we've been going through this series looking at how we got our Bible. Now, by way of review, uh, we've kind of been using a flow chart as our uh, road map to go through this material. And let me just review again real quickly. We said that in eternity past, God, the eternal creator of the universe, existed in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and truth existed in God's mind. In fact, Jesus himself said he is the way, the truth, and the life. So that truth in God's mind in eternity past had to be revealed somehow to mankind. And so through the process of revelation, that truth in God's mind became truth in the original human author's minds. And uh, the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years by some 40 different human authors representing envoys and agents that God used to reveal his truth. Uh, it was written in three different languages originally over that span of 1,500 years, the Old Testament written primarily in Hebrew and a small portion in Aramaic as time went on, and Aramaic became the common language of the people. And then the New Testament, of course, written in Koine Greek. So 1,500 year time span, 40 different human authors, three different languages from three different continents and a variety of vocations and backgrounds resulted in the book we now hold in our hands, the 66 books of the Bible. But if we go back to our flow chart here, uh, the truth in God's mind through the process of revelation became truth in the human author's minds. And then through the process of inspiration, it, the original manuscripts were written. Inspiration is the process whereby the Holy Spirit carried along those 40 human authors so that what they wrote when they wrote the original manuscripts was precisely what God intended for them to record. And then over the next uh, two or three hundred years, the church began to wrestle with uh, these copies of the Word of God. Remember, this was 2,000 years ago, and uh, this was before the printing press and before technology. And so uh, they had scribal copies and circulated letters, but uh, the original copies of the Word of God, each individual book of the Bible, very quickly kind of faded from existence. And so over time, it became necessary to sort of search through all of the scribal copies and all of the documents that were out there, some of them pretending to be part of the Word of God. Some imposters would write letters and books and claim that they were authoritative and given by God. And it just became necessary to sort through all of that and discover, indeed, which books were inspired. And we made a big deal about how the process of canonicity was not the process whereby human church leaders determined or declared which books were part of the Bible, even though that's what many uh, books would say a canonicity is. That's how canonicity is often defined, and the average person thinks that's what canonicity is. But we're suggesting that's not at all the case. Canonicity was the process uh, whereby the early church discovered which books were inspired. The one who declared them inspired was God himself, the eternal creator of the universe. He's the only one that can declare something to be truth, or uh, it either is truth or it isn't. We talked about how canonicity was kind of like searching for gold. You don't get to pick up a piece of fool's gold and just declare by fiat that it is gold. It either is or it isn't. And the 66 books of the Bible are inspired not because some human agent declared them so. They're inspired because God inspired them. Uh, then we talked about the process of preservation. Uh, over the last 2,000 years since the New Testament was written and 3,500 years since the beginning of the Old Testament, God has supernaturally preserved the ancient manuscripts so that we could study them. 
and we study them. That's called the process of textual criticism uh, for the purpose of translating them into our modern English Bibles. And then as we read the modern English Bibles that we hold in our hands today, through the process of illumination and interpretation, uh, those that truth is then deposited in our minds. And so you see through this process that we have on the screen here how truth in God's mind, uh, through all of these means, becomes truth in our minds. But the process doesn't stop there because once it becomes truth in our minds, our task is then to apply these timeless truths of Scripture that give us everything we need for life and godliness to our own lives so that our lives are changed into the image of Christ. Our goal is to become godly men and women who live out the Word of God in day-to-day -day life and represent Him uh, in this fallen world. We are supposed to be lights in this perverse generation, the Apostle Paul said. Now, as we continue through this process, we're getting now to the point of uh, our modern English versions and you know how we got our modern English Bibles that we hold in our hands. And I want us to take a walk in today's video through a chronological look at how we got our Bibles. And so this is just going to be a uh, look at history, starting with creation all the way through to the present day. And we'll kind of put some time markers on a timeline. And then we'll come back in part seven of this video series and take a look at some of the techniques that are used to translate our modern English Bibles. There are different translation uh, philosophies and translation techniques. And then uh, we're going to uh, close out the series by taking a look at some principles of application. And, and now that we've sort of uh, arrived at how we got the Bible we hold in our hands, what do we do with it? So that'll be part eight. But today we want to walk through a chronology of how we got our Bible on a timeline, keeping in mind, of course, some fundamental principles. Matthew 5.18 comes to mind where Jesus reminds us that uh, not one jot or tittle will by any means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. We need to understand that through this process that we've just talked about and through this timeline that we're going to go through today, God is supernaturally preserving his truth that he first revealed uh, through the pen of the uh, human authors some 3,500 years ago, Moses being the first one who wrote the first five books of the Bible, that God through that process has been uh, preserving his word. Remember the words of Peter the saying, we've been born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. He goes on to quote Isaiah there, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever in verse 24. So a chronological look at how we got our Bible. Let's start with creation, roughly uh, 4004 B.C. And then as we move forward, we know that the Exodus uh, began in 1446 B.C. as Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And that's when the Old Testament books began to be written. 39 books of the Old Testament written, as I said, in Hebrew and Aramaic under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Job might have been... Uh, um, one of the older books. We really don't know exactly when Job was written. It's a very unique book in the Old Testament. Um, but for certain, we know that the first five books of the Bible, starting with Genesis, were the oldest uh, books um, in, in the Old Testament canon. Uh, Malachi being the most recent, written somewhere in the 400s B.C. So 1446 B.C. to 400 B.C. Some, you know, 3,200 different human authors, yet amazing continuity. So let's fast forward uh, over that next thousand years to the time of the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC and beyond. At that time, uh, Aramaic became the common language of the uh, captives, and therefore it was necessary to translate portions of the Old Testament into Aramaic. And we call these the Aramaic Targums in the 500s BC. So we're talking about 500 years before uh, Christ. And we have here a picture of uh, part of a uh, vellum from a uh, Aramaic targum. So you can begin to see here, and this is from a scroll, of course, uh, some actual ancient uh, manuscripts, this case of the Old Testament, Aramaic here. This is uh, from Exodus chapter 21, verse 22. And this particular manuscript fragment is currently housed in the Cambridge University Library. But Jewish scribes faithfully copied the Old Testament text with amazing accuracy uh, during this time and all the way up, frankly, till uh, the Middle Ages and so forth, till the time of the printing press. Um, then you have, uh, fast forwarding another couple hundred years, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch. This was a Hebrew translation of the 
first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, as we call it, the books of Moses. It was uh, translated in order to facilitate Samaritan worship at Mount Gerizim. Remember the contrast there between the Samaritans and the Jews, and you know they had different um, holy mountains, as it were. And here is a manuscript uh, fragment of the Samaritan Pentateuch. So I'm going to be giving you lots of uh, visuals in this chronology here to just kind of uh, plant some seeds and help you just understand, as we think about the doctrine of preservation, how God has supernaturally, whatever the medium may be, whether it was a scroll or a papyrus or whatever it might be, God has supernaturally preserved his truth. Every jot and tittle, when the quill hit the sheepskin, uh, over that 1,500-year period of time, we now have extant, extant meaning in existence, in our possession today. Uh, of course, we have scribal variations. We talked about that in uh, part five of our series and, and how the, the scribal errors in no way impugns the integrity and the authority of God's Word because that's just like a typographical error. We can examine those typographical errors and we can uh, pretty reasonably conclude what most likely represented the original text. Um, but the important thing to remember is that within all of these manuscripts and, and fragments and so forth, uh, we have contained the very Word of God. So then if we go to another important date in the chronology of how we got our Bible, the Bible we hold in our hands today, uh, that's the formation of the Septuagint, the Septuagint in 285 B.C. This is when a group of 70 elders in Israel were brought to Alexandria, Egypt, for the purpose of translating the Old Testament into Greek. Now, of course, we're getting into the uh, Greco-Roman period, and so Greek became the common language. And so, uh, just as we had the Aramaic translations, now we have a Greek translation of the Old Testament, so that people in that time period could study the Bible. Remember, at this up to this point in our chronology, all we have is the Old Testament. The New Testament has not been unveiled yet by God through the pen of the human authors. Christ has not come. We haven't had Bethlehem and Christmas and the ministry of Christ. We haven't had the, uh, the crucifixion and resurrection, the beginning of the church age, and we haven't had the beginning of the unveiling of the Greek New Testament. But yet, Greek as a language became the common language of the day, and so it was necessary to translate uh, the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures into Greek. So here's a fragment from the Septuagint. You see the symbol there, LXX, that's the Roman number 70, and that's often how you see the Septuagint uh, you know, uh, recorded. It's it's often referred to as the LXX, and that refers to the seventy uh, elders that 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 translated it from Hebrew into Greek. So the LXX is just another way to say the Septuagint. So now let's fast forward into the Apostolic Age and the New Testament period. The twenty-seven books of the New Testament were written by some eight authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit beginning in 44 A.D., all the way through the end of the first century, roughly 96 or 97 A.D., so about a 50-year period. Whereas the Old Testament was written over a time span of 1,500 years, the New Testament was written over a time period of some 50 years. So to put some benchmark dates in there, the, of course the crucifixion and resurrection was 33 A.D., so the church was founded in 33 A.D., and here we are some 10 or 11 years later, and the first book was written. The first book was most likely either James, the Lord's brother who wrote that short epistle, or Matthew who wrote the first gospel. Now I understand that many modern scholars, particularly since the rise of higher criticism, uh, have suggested that Mark was the first gospel, and Matthew came later. Uh, but for some 1,900 years, frankly, church history has always accepted Matthew as the earliest gospel, and there's quite a bit of evidence to support that view. Uh, I happen to hold that view, uh, as do many conservative scholars, though uh, it's not necessarily a conservative or liberal issue. Many conservative scholars have uh, changed their view and now hold to a what's called Markan priority, that Mark was the first gospel. But I think the best evidence and the historical evidence uh, is uh, very clear that Matthew <laughs> was the number one gospel, and it was written roughly 44 to 47 AD. So Matthew, possibly James, one of those two was probably the first book written in the New Testament. And then uh, the last book, of course, was the book of Revelation, written around 96 AD. And again, many modern scholars today are trying to suggest 
particularly if they're from a different theological perspective that, than we're coming from. I'm coming from a traditional, dispensational, grace-oriented perspective on theology. As I read the Scripture in its literal, grammatical, historical sense, uh, the natural interpretation of Scripture compels me uh, to understand God's plan of the ages in that way. Um, uh, those who take a more allegorical approach to Scripture and spiritualize the text have tended to suggest that Revelation was written uh, in 70 A.D. or before 70 A.D. Uh, but I think the evidence is pretty clear uh, that it was written in 96 A.D. In fact, I attended a debate one time between March, Mark Hitchcock and Hank Hanegraaff. Uh, Mark Hitchcock, a colleague of mine who uh, holds to you know the traditional date of Revelation being 96 A.D., uh, was debating uh, the preterist Hank Hanegraaff, who believes that the Bible, that Revelation was written in 70 A.D., and it wasn't really even close. It was uh, it was so overwhelmingly a victory in the in the good natured debate, comparing evidence with evidence, that indeed Revelation was written in 96 A.D. And I'm sure you can find that debate uh, on uh, YouTube or somewhere like that. So the New Testament written 44 to 96 A.D. And then as you begin to fast forward. Uh, basically, for the next some 1,400 years, uh, you have scribes copying those original Greek manuscripts into uh, scribal copies that were then circulated. From the 300s to the 800s, they did this in what's called unsealed script, capital letters, and we have about 300 uh, manuscripts still surviving or so, maybe three to 400, uh, from that time period, the 300s to the 800s. Then from the 800s to the 1400s, they, by then they had, uh, you know, began to use minuscule script, a different kind of Greek script, uh, lowercase and uppercase. Um, and uh, we have, you know, some 2,800, maybe 3,000 or more uh, manuscripts that date from the 800s to the 1400s. So here's some minuscule manuscript fragments. You can begin to see some of the influence there of the artistic developments through time into the Middle Ages and so forth. Um, but that's minuscule manuscripts. In all, we have more than 6,000 New Testament manuscripts and fragments that have been found to date, which is really remarkable when you consider, by comparison, the manuscripts that we have available of other Greek literature. For example, Tacitus, we have two surviving manuscripts from the first century. Uh, Thucydides from the fifth century, eight surviving manuscripts. Herodotus, uh, also from the fifth century, eight surviving manuscripts. Euripides from the fifth century, nine surviving manuscripts. And yet we base history upon these Greek philosophers and historians. H history books that you read in school are based upon what these men said. They're accepted as truth. And yet you can tell, you know, you can count on basically two hands, uh, almost, the, the number of manuscripts that we have, and yet compare that to the thousands upon thousands that we have of the New Testament. And yet, strangely enough, the New Testament is maligned and uh, skeptics reject it and question it. So it just really shows the remarkable nature of God's preservation. One of the oldest, the oldest, in fact, uh, manuscript fragment in existence today of the New Testament, dates from about 100 to 150 AD, so the first half of the second century. This was uh, rediscovered by C.H. Roberts while going over a collection of papyri at the John Rylands Library in Manchester, England. It's the oldest copy uh, of any portion of the Greek New Testament in existence today. And they label these, when they find them, they catalog them. Textual critics do, scientists do. This one's labeled P52. And uh, it's two and a half by three and a half inches long and contains a few verses of the Gospel of John from chapter 18, from chapter 18. Uh, here's another one from the beginning of the 3rd century, a P46 leaf. Uh, this was acquired by Sir Chester Beatty of London in the 1930s. So again, as archaeological advancements have occurred and as modernization occurred, uh, we began to uncover and catalog and just see over the last 100 to 200 years uh, just how amazing God's preservation uh, is. This particular leaf uh, it's currently held at the University of Michigan. It uh, uh, contains a Greek text of the New Testament uh, containing originally 104 leaves. You can tell this is kind of a leaf from a, a larger codex. Um, and it, uh, the 104 leaves originally contained 10 of Paul's epistles in one binding. And uh, it was missing uh, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Interestingly enough, it did include Hebrews, and uh, we see this again and again in early manuscript codices. A codex is a bound set of 
uh, leaves, much like a book would be today, uh, as opposed to just a single leaflet, or in the Old Testament times, a scroll on sheepskin. Um, but it, you see this again and again where Hebrews was bundled together with Paul's other epistles. Uh, one of the many reasons that uh, scholars, and, and I am in, in this category, uh, believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. Now, we can't say for certain there are good arguments that other you know that others make that uh, maybe Apollos or someone else wrote it, uh, but I think the best evidence, and certainly the historical evidence, is that uh, Paul wrote it. Uh, here's one from, again, the 3rd century A.D., a P45 leaf. This is uh, kept currently in Dublin at the Beatty Museum. It contained 200 leaves from parts of all four of the Gospels and Acts. Here's a P66 leaf. Uh, this is the oldest considerable portion uh, of the entire Gospel of John. Uh, it's called labeled the P66 leaf. Uh, Martin Bottomer acquired it, uh, Bodmer in Geneva, 1956. So again, as we said, in all, a total of some 100, give or take, they're constantly finding new and cataloging them, and I'm not, uh, by my specialty, a, a textual critic, though I've taught textual criticism uh, many for many years in the, the graduate level. It's not my field of expertise as a theologian, so I don't keep up with it as, as well as maybe others do. But the last time I researched it, there was a total of about 100 surviving papyri. There probably are more now. Who knows? You don't find papyri from, the, from this time period uh, very often because obviously they're scarce and they've disintegrated. The further on we go in time, the more new discoveries there are almost uh, every year. And then we get to the famous Codex Sinaiticus, discovered by Tischendorf at the Monastery of St. Catherine uh, in 1859. Uh, this is a very famous ancient uncial script, capital letters again, um, and uh, it's the only complete copy of the New Testament in uncial script, and it's one of the top two manuscripts on which almost all modern versions of the New Testament our base. It's an interesting story. If I can give you a little bit of the backstory uh, here. Uh, by the way, here is uh, the monastery uh, where this took place, where this was discovered, St. Catherine's Monastery, the foothills of Mount Sinai. But again, this codex in 1844, uh, Tischendorf visited the, this monastery and he noticed some leaves in a wastebasket full of papers destined to light the oven of the monastery. Well, he took a closer look and they turned out to be very old New Testament manuscripts. So he returned twice trying to find more. And during a subsequent visit in 1859, the day before he was to leave, he presented a copy of his codex, the one he had found in 1844 in the wastebasket, to the steward of the monastery. And the steward basically said, and I'm paraphrasing here, hey, wait here, I've I've got something, or I've seen something somewhere else in this monastery that looks very similar to this. <laughs> and so he returned a few moments later with what now has come to be called Codex. Remember, a Codex is just a bound set of leaves. Uh, Codex Sinaiticus. And it represents the Alexandrian text family. Of course, it was found in the Alexandrian region. That's what that means. And it's on display in the British uh, Museum. So it originally contained about 720 leaves, each measuring 15 by 13 and a half inches, four columns to the page. But today the Old Testament portion consists of 43 leaves, and it's kind of scattered around and kept in different places. So that's an interesting story. And what's so interesting about that is that this codex, found again around St. Catherine's Monastery in Alexandria, uh, has become the standard uh, manuscript from which most modern English translations are uh, made. And that's why you saw the proliferation of English translations around the turn of the 20th century, because this was found in the late 19th century, and then uh, with Westcott and Hort, whom we'll talk about, uh, it became uh, you know, kind of the accepted one. Now, as I've said, I think previously in this video series, I still hold to uh, the majority text. We'll get into uh, that a little bit uh, later when we talk about translation technique and so forth uh, in the next video series. Uh, next series, uh, installment in this series, um, but you need to understand that this is a, was a very significant find. Another significant one is Codex Vaticanus, Codex Vaticanus, and uh, this was uh, consisted of 759 leaves, 
uh, today anyway, it originally had 820, 10 and 5 eighths inches by 10 and 5 eighths inches with three columns per page. The Old Testament was complete, but all of the New Testament after Hebrews 9.14 is lost, including the pastoral epistles and Revelation. And uh, this one's kind of interesting because you'll notice if you see in that uh, square uh, there are a picture on the screen, you can see off to the left what looks like a note in the margin. And as we said when we were talking about scribal errors in the previous uh, installment in this video series, it was not at all uncommon uh, to have uh, scribes make notes in the margin either with their suggested changes or corrections to what they perceived as a typo from the previous scribe because they're copying copies from copies from copies. So over time there began, began to be what you might call these editor's notes or scribal notes in the margin. And here's one that one uh, that's, that I find interesting that one scribe wrote. Again, this is from you know 300 years after the time of Christ. And he wrote, you can see it there, and here's the translation. The little scribal note in the margin there says, Fool and knave, can't you leave the old reading alone and not alter it? <laughs> so this scribe evidently felt like the copy that he was copying from uh, had made a scribal uh, error or variation that he didn't agree with. And he said, hey, wh why did you change this? Leave it alone. Let it go like the original. So that's just an interesting a little... Um, Side note. Uh, then you got in the 400s Codex Alexandrinus, another very famous uh, Alexandrian based uh, codex. It's in Britain's uh, possession today. Uh, and then you get into the, uh, the Syriac Peshitta, 400s AD. Uh, the term Syriac describes the Eastern Aramaic language spoken in northern Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, uh, sort of northeast of the land of Palestine there. Large Jewish settlements were located there, and, and at some point, the Old Testament was translated into Syriac for their benefit. Eventually, the New Testament was also translated into Syriac, and together they make up what is called the Peshitta. In its present form, it can be traced back to the 5th century AD. Uh, however, some Syriac fragments of the Gospels uh, have been found which go back to the 2nd century AD, and we call those the Old Syriac version. And then uh, you come to Jerome's famous translation, a beautiful uh, translation of Jerome. Um, done by Jerome in Latin uh, of the Old and New Testaments uh, from their original Greeks. And so as Latin began to replace Greek as the common language of the Roman Empire in about the 2nd century AD, it was necessary to translate the Bible into Latin. And Jerome did that. So it's a very valuable translation. So you've got, of course, the Hebrew translation, then the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, then the New Testament, and then you in Greek, and then you have the Latin translation of the Hebrew and the Greek. So it's a, it's a in the in the process uh, in the chronology here of how we got our Bible. The Jerome Latin Vulgate is a very important text. Uh, the Masoretic text in about the sixth century A.D. A group of uh, people called the Masoretes took over copying the Hebrew Old Testament text from the Jewish scribes, and their work became known as the Masoretic text, and it became and still is the universally accepted text of the Old Testament. Sometimes you'll see it translated M.T., Masoretic Text. You have to be careful because in the New Testament English Bibles and your marginal notes in the in New Testament, sometimes you'll see M.T., and that refers to majority text, which is different. Uh, but the Masoretic Text is the Hebrew Old Testament, and pretty much all English Bibles today, the Old Testament is translated from the Masoretic Text. And if you ever get the chance to see one of these scrolls, it's really fascinating. There are a few of them in existence around. Uh, I know Josh McDowell owns one, and I got to see uh, one of those. But uh, you know, the Masoretes were also the ones that gave the Hebrew text its vowel point. You remember the Hebrew uh, language has no vowels. It's all consonants. And it was a spoken language, primarily, and therefore uh, they just could tell by looking at the consonants how to pronounce a particular word. But it was later on as uh, Hebrew wasn't as common a language, but other people from around other parts of the world and other cultures who didn't speak Hebrew wanted to study it, it became necessary to put vowel markers in there and vowel uh, pointers in there. So in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, would be discovered by a Bedouin shepherd in a cave about seven miles south of Jericho and a mile from the Dead Sea, and these contained many, many, many leather-covered scrolls of the Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament. And they pushed back the history of the Old Testament about a thousand years. 
Prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, listen carefully, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest known Hebrew manuscript still in existence was from the 800s AD. So in other words, the Masoretes started translating these Hebrew scrolls of the Old Testament in the 500s AD. But of course, over time, they disintegrate, they get lost, they get destroyed. And so all we had prior to 1947 in existence in terms of copies of the Hebrew Old Testament were from the 800s AD. We had New Testament manuscripts that were older than that. Um, but when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, these were copy scrolls that had been tucked away in caves. Uh, they dated from about 200 B.C. So that's a thousand years earlier. And what we discovered is that the wording and every jot and tittle in these Hebrew manuscripts that dated from 200 years before Christ was almost identical to what it was a thousand years later in the 800s A.D. Uh, you know that we had, so that we've been having already. So in other words, that just validates how meticulous the Hebrew scribes were. And uh, if only the New Testament scribes had been quite as meticulous, though uh, they were uh, not bad either. As we've said last time, you know, even though there are some scribal typographical errors, so to speak, most of the manuscripts agree 98% of the time. Uh, so now let's fast forward again back to our chronology here. Now we're getting into the, you know, the 14th century. Uh, Wycliffe's translation. He was the first English translation of the entire Bible. That's what he's famous for. Now, Wycliffe translated it, however, from Jerome's Latin Vulgate. So it's not a translation from the original language. Because remember, Jerome translated his into Latin, and then it became, uh, you know, English from Wycliffe. Uh, you know, 1382, uh, again, uh, Wycliffe uh, began this process. Uh, his translation work was part of a larger task of reforming the church. Um, he uh, is really an amazing story. He was uh, considered a heretic, and uh, he uh, was denounced in 1415. His Bible was condemned and burned in 1428. You know, he died in 1384, but in 1428, he was so hated by the Catholic Church that he was his body was exhumed and burned. So then you get into Gutenberg's project with the, uh, with the uh, printing press, and Gutenberg's first major product was Jerome's Latin Vulgate. That's what the first thing they did on the printing press. And so there you can see a copy of that, uh, 1488 uh, or so. And then you see, you get into all of the Greek uh, translations, like the Complutensian Polyglot was the first Greek New Testament, New Testament uh, printed. Uh, it sounds like a crazy name, Complutensian Polyglot, um, but it was simply because it was a polyglot, mean, meaning multi-language. It contained a Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, kind of like a parallel Bible would be today. And it was, uh, you know, from a town called Complutum. So it's Complutum Polyglot. And here's a picture uh, of the Complutium, uh, Complutensian Polyglot. And then you get into Erasmus's Greek New Testament. Erasmus is uh, just an amazing... Uh, figure in the history of the English Bible, and um, you know his Greek New Testament was published and marketed to compete with that Complutensian text, and his uh, uh, Bible really became ultimately the basis for the King James and the New King James, which we're getting up to in our process here. These are some other ancient texts. You know that once you had the printing press, you began to see a sort of a marketing flurry as, as individuals and entities wanted to print things that could be marketed and sold. Here's the Aldine text, 1518. Tyndale's Bible was 1526 and 1530. He's considered the father of the English Bible, and he wanted to make the scriptures available to all. And uh, here's a copy of Tyndale's Bible. So Tyndale was unable to get permission from the church or parliament to do his translation in England, so he went to the continent. And in February 1526, his New Testament was translated from the Greek and printed, and uh, copies of it soon arrived in England, and they were publicly burned uh, by the Bishop of London at the time. But he continued his work, and eventually, uh, as he was burned at the stake, strangled and burned at the stake in England, uh, his last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes, and that king was Henry VIII. Uh, 
uh, so Tyndale, the father of the modern English Bible, an actual translation from Greek and Hebrew. Here's some more Erasmus, uh, the TR in 1535. It was actually Erasmus's fifth edition, and it became uh, known as the Textus Receptus, because later uh, a uh, claim by uh, the Ele Ele Elsevier brothers of Leiden that uh, this text was received by all. It's kind of the in the marking blurb at the, at the beginning of their uh, printed copy of the Textus Receptus. They said, look, this is the received text. Textus Receptus is Latin for received text. And it became uh, the manuscript on which the King James was based. And then you got the 1536 Cloverdale Bible. Cloverdale Bible. Again, just some more uh, English Bibles. The Matthew Bible is interesting. Uh, this is uh, a copy of the Matthew Bible, 1537. It is also known famously as, believe it or not, the Wife Beater's Bible. <laughs> the Wife Beater's Bible. And this is because of a note at the end of 1 Peter 3, in which it says in the you know, translators and editors notes, If she be not obedient and helpful unto him, endeavoreth to beat the fear of God into her head, that thereby she may be compelled to learn her duty and do it. So certainly not a very politically correct Bible. It just goes to show you that even 500 years ago, they were still dealing with social and cultural issues, and you had people that didn't always have good motives that were translating uh, the Bible. Uh, then you've got the Stephanus text. This is a fascinating text as we wrap up our video today. Uh, Stephanus' text is noteworthy because he's the first one that put verse uh, numbers and divided the text into verses so that we can... Um, you know, study it more easily today, 1550. And you can kind of see in his text here, if you look closely, uh, the text numbers written out in the margin of his Bible. Just really fascinating. Legend has it that he did this as he was riding horseback between cities. And that's the reason that sometimes as he was riding, his pen would fall randomly in a certain spot and it would end up uh, being a strange verse division. That's the reason you have some odd verse divisions today in our Bibles where it splits a sentence in the middle and so forth. But it's still helpful as a roadmap to be able to study the Scripture so we can find, for example, John 3.16 and so forth. Then, of course, 1611, uh, King uh, James VI uh, ascended to the throne of England and became uh, as James I in 1603. And then uh, he ended up uh, commissioning the English translation of the Bible, and it, of course, sir, has served us well for hundreds of years. And I have a printed uh, leaf from one of the original 1611, early 1611 uh, King James uh, translations. Westcott and Hort in 1881 uh, were the father of, uh, led to the rise of higher criticism. And these guys are pretty interesting. Two British scholars uh, their work kind of became the standard for all Alexandrian-based Greek translations and all future English translations, uh, but they were not, uh, you know, the most godly guys, let's be honest. Um, and I think there's reason to be very skeptical of their work. That's why I really reject a lot of the modern higher critical approaches to English translations of the Bible. Um, they rejected the idea overwhelmingly of the infallibility of the Bible, and Hort said, both of them did, Westcott and Hort. Um, he called the doctrine of the Hort called the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement immoral. Westcott wrote that the idea of propitiating uh, propitiation is foreign to the New Testament, and he taught that salvation came by changing one's behavior. <laughs> so, I mean, these guys were not uh, necessarily, you know, pure in their motives. Uh, and there's reason to wonder whether they were even Christians. I mean, we don't know what was inside their mind, but they certainly gave indications that they maybe never had trusted Christ. They were both members of secret societies. Westcott and Hort founded one called the Ghostly Guild, a club where members gathered to relate personal experiences that they had had with ghosts. Um, in 1872, Westcott formed another secret society called the Uranus Club. Uh, so... You know, these guys were are often celebrated by a lot of modern scholars today, but they really don't understand the background of what these guys were into. And so if you go back to our timeline here, that was the late 19th century, early 1900s, and that led to the rise of many modern English versions. And we're going to look at some of those uh, as we go through the, the next step.
in our process. So we're going to take a look next time at translation and take a look at some of these modern English Bibles and how we got them. But that's all the time we have for today. Once again, thanks for listening. My name is JB with Not By Works Ministries, and you can find out more about us and learn more and study more on this topic by visiting notbyworks.org.